there's a bit of a meme of making similar sounding names to Benedict Cumberbatch and calling him by those names. Okay. Um, but it's it's a and it's it's kind of a game, and it's one I feel quite strongly about because a lot of people, I think they do it really wrong. They call them like Bludgeon Thunder Dunder and things <laughs> like that, right? But there's so many options that actually preserve both the the prosody and the rhyme and a lot of the the initial sounds of Benedict Cumberbatch. So. I had this written down here somewhere, but I'm not sure where I put it. I have like three or so <laughs> rules on how to and how to name him on how to come up with alternate names. Uh, okay, have you? Have, and as long as you wait, have you got an exemplar of a correct naming convention for Benedict Cumberbatch? Uh, yeah. Okay. For example, I think like something something like Burgundy Kerouac is a lot better. Oh, I see what you're doing there. Yes. because the stresses are in the right place. Mm-hmm. You've got the b and the k sound as the initials, and you've got the I think the the rhyme at the end of the word, the a vowel at the end of the name is quite important as well. And as long as you satisfy like two of those requirements, I think it's it's a successful Benedict Cumberbatch name. <laughs> is this phenomenon phenomenon limited to Benedict Cumberbatch? Well, it's the only name I know for which people perform this game you don't perform a game bill where which people play this game <laughs> um but it's it's a uh, i'm sure that i'm sure there, there could be others so burgundy carowack burgundy carowack Bur- <laughs> or bechamel capri pants <laughs> bechamel capri pants <laughs> oh man that's brilliant <laughs> or Benzedrine Cumberbund. <laughs> now, that's not as strong because it doesn't have the ah sound at the end. The, the rhyme isn't there. The, the vowel rhyme isn't there. But it, it, it follows the right prosody. The ba ba da da ba da The right stresses are there. And it's got the B and the C sound. Now, you could take... You could say something like Boilerplate Thundersnatch. And that would have the right prosody... It oh. doesn't c- preserve the initials, but it does preserve the rhyme. Or the, the vowel at the end, the vowel rhyme. Oh man, that's just fantastic. <laughs> I love how you've thought about this so much. Well, look. <laughs> I don't think it's that weird. I I like I like Balthazar Cumberland as an actor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it this is a and he's got a fun name to say. So why not play around with it? And I think, I think that I'm sh- I'm sure there's you know Graham Norton or someone else has had Bennigan Crumble Pants on the show, and has, has explained this game to him. And as, as I recall, he quite liked it. So, are you coming up with these things on the fly, or do you have like a mega list, a Benedict Cumberbatch mega list? A little of both. But anyway, that's that's why Bonaparte Cadillac was in the show notes. <laughs> So, hang on, g- give, me, g- give me the rules again, right? In case anyone in the sub wants to play by the correct rules. What are the rules of correctly bastardizing Benedict Cumberbatch? Well, these are just suggestions on my part. I- I'm sure you could you could tweak them. And I, I haven't, like, s- sat down and thought of that, that, thematic- oh, that systematically, only a little systematically. But my rules are, um, number one, preserve the initial sounds. So mm. the... B and the K, the, the voiced bilabial plosive and the uh, v- K, unvoiced velar stop? Uh, unvoiced velar plosive? No. Velar plosive? I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something velar. Um, so preserve that. Then follow the same uh, rhythm. So the yada da 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 da. Benedict okay. Cumberbatch. Ballantine Copperhat. <laughs> Following the same rhythm. <laughs> Valentine Copperhatch. <laughs> <laughs> and then having the right vowel sound at the end. So, and I think if you satisfy two of those three rules, it's a very successful Betel- Betamax Crinkle Dash name. <laughs>
Oh, Bill. Oh, my God. Bill, this is so amazing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate to put, like, the title of the show. I hate to make the title of the show the thing at the very start because sometimes it's really nice to um, have the title appear at the very, very end of the show. So you're left guessing as to why is this show called whatever it is. I think Betamax Crinkle Dash. <laughs> I think that's got to be the title. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's not be hasty. We may yet say something even more ridiculous. <laughs> I did. That would be. We would be hard pushed to do that. If we do, we be would great. be hard pushed. We would be hard pushed. I think if we say something more ridiculous than that, a singularity might open and swallow the world whole. <laughs> uh, so you remember uh, I did a plate tectonics video a way back uh, a while back. Yes. So I was recently watching a minute physics video. Uh, that mm-hmm. talks about some geological formations on Europa. I think it was Europa. I can't remember. It's been a while since I watched it. Um, and there's a phenomenon whereby the sort of like fracture lines along the planet are kind of arced. Um, like a series of small arcs or whatever. And there's a geological reason as to why these cracks appear like that. And he also points out that these cracks, uh, these sort of arc cracks also appear on Earth in terms of like uh, plate boundaries. And I was like, that's a cool world building point. I did not realize that plate tectonics should have this sort of like uh, structure to them. So I'm going to leave this uh, video in the show notes and people should go check it out. And if anyone is designing plate tectonics at the moment, they should uh, at least put a little bit of this in as a sort of like uh, extra added realism sort of thing. Cool, yeah. Which is really cool. Just a very quick like shout out to that and, and point people. Um, next point uh, I want to bring up is uh, via Oshin, who undoubtedly is a uh, Irish listener. Um, and Seems likely. Seems likely. And they uh, sent an email uh asking what our thoughts about the Navajo Nation flag is. And considering we haven't done flag corner in a while, I thought it'd be a really cool idea to talk about the Navajo Nation flag. So, have you got any thoughts? It's not great. No. <laughs> did you know this before receiving the email? I did not. You did not? This was a new one to you. Hmm. I think it was a new one to me, yeah. Do you want to wanna give a descriptor if you have it open in front of you? Well, I have the I have the Wikipedia page open, and I can read out the design, or will I just kind of? Oh, is there? Do Wikipedia extemporize? W- does Wikipedia give like an actual design? Um, kind of, yeah. Yeah, no, I'd extemporize. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, no, that's boring. Boring Wikipedia. Extemporize. So what we have here is a kind of a pale pink flag, at least in this image. Oh jeez, I call with... it. I call it fierce beige altogether, like aggressively beige. Yeah, yeah, I could, I could describe it as a beige. I could live with that. Um, a sort of a beigey background with a, a free a free coloured rainbow uh, taking up a large part of the field or enclosing a large part of the field in red, yellow, and blue. Now, underneath this rainbow, there are arranged um, four sort of mountain designs. Mm-hmm. The one at the top is black. The one below it is blue. Pale, um, the one to the hoist is yellow. And the one towards the fly is white. Mm-hmm. And these, within this area, there's what I, I'm going to guess is some kind of stylized map. um, In a sort of a darker brown and then in a sort of a grey with sort of various overlapping zones. And within that, there's a white circle. Mm. And within that... <laughs> There is a seal which has kind of these green, they're like laurel leaves crossing at the bottom and extending up around a, a large part of the circumference of the of the circle. Mm-hmm. And within that, there are several smaller uh, designs. Um, a cow and like an, an oil well thing, a barn. I don't know what that is. Two buildings, two trees, and a sun with six rays coming out of it. 
Yeah. So it's nice and simple. It is. It's it's not complicated whatsoever. <clears throat> the uh, the map in the middle has always reminded me of a, a like an eight bit like pig, like a Minecraft pig. Uh, I can see it. On the left, it's got a little tail hanging out, and then on the right, you can like the front, the most like rightward part looks like a little snout, so it looks like a pig. Um, my th- there are problems with this flag, obviously. Like there's too much going on, but like the biggest thing is the centering of the seal. Like, and I, I appreciate that they can't put the seal in the center of the flag because that would overlap yeah. with uh, with the boundaries. But it just makes it really awkward looking, especially if you like kind of blur your eyes a little bit and look at it from the distance. It looks it looks quite odd. And like the color scheme is really strong in this flag, so they could really come up with a great design. And like they're already sort of bordering on the minimalist, with, like with regards to the map, like it's really eight bit, and the mountains are very minimal. The the rainbow is very minimal, so they're like they're so close to a good flag with a little bit of tweaking. They just decided that let's go full America on this and slap seals and details everywhere. So it's like yeah, it's not terrible. <clears throat> And it's salvageable, but they just they just ducked out at the last moment, you know. I will say two things in its defense. Mm. It is very American. Uh, yeah, but it is. It is very like typically. This is what what American flags are like. It's kind of a perfect example of that. So it's interesting in that regard. Mm. And apparently, uh, the correct ratio is ten to nineteen, 10 which is to rather 19? neat. 10 to 19. What Apparently. Is, what is that? That's... No, that's the wrong way around. 19 to 10. <clears throat> uh, yeah, oh, God, Jesus. I had to calculate that, and it's clearly 1.9 to... Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, that's weird. Would you not just make it 2 to 1, Like That's that's bizarre. Um, oh, that? actually, hold on. The, 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 the US flag is 10 to 19, apparently. Oh, so maybe that's a standard sort of uh, Pan America, yeah. Pan America thing. Maybe, yeah. But anyway, yeah. So not, not, not sh- flag. Not the worst flag. Um, not the best by a long shot. Pretty bad. Yeah, it's salvageable, salvageable, and it, it's got but an eight bit. It's pig, not old so Provo. It's not old Provo. No, thank Christ. Oh. It's not even New Provo. I mean, New New Provo isn't isn't pretty particularly great either. What is New Provo? New Provo flag. Um, oh boy, this internet is stunning. Oh yeah, no, that's not brilliant either. That looks like a terrible, terrible corporate emblem, like a sort of self help center, mm. like a, a rehab center for wealthy celebrities. That's what the logo looks like. <laughs> Not a fan. Like some of some of these flag redesigns, like I appreciate that they replace truly awful flags, but they're not great. Like like the the Pocatello Pocatello uh, Pocatello Pocatello redesign is like it's what, what fine, it? but have it, I seen it's not. the redesign? I don't know if I have. Oh, like go Google it. It's not it's not great, and I've I've particular grievances against that um, river running down the bottom of the flag. I'm not I'm not a fan of that. I think it's superfluous to requirements. Yeah, it's it's not it's not brilliant. Um... And I suspect now I haven't done this, but just from eyeballing it, I suspect that the saturation levels of the red and the blue are fairly similar. So if you were to do the grayscale test, I don't think there's a hell of a lot of contrast going on there, which isn't great in terms of people who you know don't see the color spectrum uh, as well as most people do, you know? Right. I, I didn't um, know that was, a, that was a thing, a grayscale test for flags. Or is it for, for design in general? Uh, well, a uh, bit, of, bit of both maybe, but it was in my video where it was like, check to see if it works in grayscale. Um, oh, okay. And if it does, it's I'd good. I've that. Technically, technically, uh, I would add to my own video and say that check to see if it works for various color, blind, uh, color blindness types. Yeah. Which is which is really easy to do. Like it's just you flick a switch in Illustrator that it has a big drop down menu of uh, all the different types of color blindness and it overlays like a filter on top of everything you do, so you can check to see whether or not people who have like do 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 to not do Deuteronomy, do to something or other, I can't remember um, whether or not they would be able to make it. Yes, that could possibly be it. Um, but yeah, yeah, you can just it's just really simple to do 
and it's I think it's worth doing. Um, just because yeah, everyone everyone on nope. the flag should That's be able to appreciate called. said flag. What? That's not what it's called. That's not what it's called. <laughs> no, uh, but I said it really confidently. You did. Deuteranopia. Deuter. That sounds even more accurate. Color blindness. Yeah. Um, hold on now. Oh Jesus! Can you not just give a list like? Yeah, protonopia, deuteranopia, proto anomaly, and deuteranomaly. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the redesigns aren't great. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a fan of some of the redesigns, but they are better than the, the ones before. Anyhow, anyhow, they so are we move certainly on. improvements. Let's move on. Okay, uh, voting systems. Uh, we mm -hmm. talked at the end of the last show about the Eurovision voting system, and uh, as a result, lots of people sent in like different types of voting systems, which is not a thing I was calling for, but I was really happy that uh, people did. And there was loads of them, but I picked out two that I thought were kind of particularly interesting in terms of like world building and potentially applying it to a uh, fictional setting. And those mm -hmm. were, uh, one came from uh, Dominic Spies or Spies, because Dominic is, is German. He's the space cartographer. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. Probably Spies then. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm imagining it's Spies, but it doesn't look very German, that 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 uh, that name. I'd imagine it might be a made-up username as well. But anyhow, anyhow. Um, the, uh, he brought up uh, a sort of democracy lottery, which I thought was really interesting, and I had no idea existed as a theory. Um, and it's where citizens vote for various candidates, and then all of these votes are put into a big drum uh, and a winner is just chosen from the drum like a lottery. And the idea being that like the more votes a candidate gets, the more likely it is, uh, they are to get elected, but it's not guaranteed. And I think if I recall correctly, the sort of advantage of this rather strange system is that it can't really be gamed. You know, like it is at the end of the day, it is kind of random. So you can't like, yeah, you can't game the system. And I thought that was a really cool example of a voting system and I had no idea it existed that's terrifying I mean yeah like it's yeah definitely but it's a cool thing to play with in, fi in fiction um sure and I guess I mean if you if you don't want the I, it might be good for, for tackling voter apathy because if you don't want the the terrible candidate to win on a fluke you want to stack the odds against them as much as possible yeah, Essentially. See, I see that as a negative point to the system because I feel like political, uh, the political establishment would be hesitant to take on such a system because of that. Because like, it, yeah. it, they want apathy in voters. Like That's good for politics to have some degree of apathy. And if you found a way of eliminating apathy, that, I don't think that works well for the political class. Uh, so the, uh, the, other, the other voting system... Uh, comes from u slash googleplex byte, which is a class username. <laughs> and it's this idea of super forecasters. Super foreca a sort of super forecaster system is the idea where uh, every person gets a vote. So mm -hmm. You vote for your candidate. But you also have to indicate how you think the election will come out. And which, again, which I didn't realize this was a thing, uh, but I think it's super interesting. I'm not sure I'd like the system to live under the system, but you know, um, and the idea is that uh, you can eliminate some sort of some biases in voters by this because having to gauge the outcome of election fairly uh, eliminates like partisan behavior, according to Google Plex Byte. Um, and mm -hmm. I think it's another really cool thing. Like, imagine a world where you go to the ballot where you tick like, I want to vote for Jane Smith. And but I think that uh, John Lieberman is actually going to win. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm following it entirely. My my questions here are: um, what's to stop you lying about your confidence to game the system? Your vote will be weighted with respect to your uh, predictive confidence. So. Like, if you want your vote to count more... I'm 100% want... confident in everything I say, though. You what? What if, what if, what if everyone just insists that they're 100% confident? 
Yeah, but that's like a kind of like, if no one showed up for school, there will be no school. Like, it, it's very hard for everyone just to be all like, we're, we're doing this to like, defeat the system. Do you know what I mean? Like I don't the, think I don't think it is. I I think this requires too much honesty. From from my understanding of it, it requires people to be honest and actually understand it. And I think it's it's a pretty complex thing to to like accurately give your own confidence in your in your prediction. Really? I don't think people te- I don't think people tend to do that. Hmm. Are you sure? Because like every time I voted, like I've I've voted whichever way I vote, but I always have opinions as to, like, how valid my vote will be. Like, you know, I vote for a candidate X, but, like, deep down I know that we, we live in a situation where party Y is going to get in. You know what I mean? Like, you... Uh, yeah, okay, I see what you mean there. I, I just don't think... I don't think that... accounting for your own confidence is a thing people naturally tend to do when, when, when making predictions or making... Hmm... And then the other thing is, this requires them to be honest, presumably. Yeah, but it's but remember, it's 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 honesty that favors themselves. So, like the more the more honest they are, the more weight their vote is given. Do you know, like if you like, but how how do you how, how do you judge that? And then if you're talking hmm. about like just regular people who are co- consistently accurate, are, are super forecasters, does that not violate the secrecy of the ballot? Or if you're talking about the super forecasters as being specific public figures, you know, say like Nate Silver or someone, then does that not leave that open to influence? Hmm, that's in interesting. In practical terms. Now, I wonder, I wonder if this system is a system that actually exists in the real world, or is this a, um, is this theory? Because um, I don't think this was mentioned in the thread. I'd like to know if anyone, if any, if any country actually runs this, and that would be a good way of like answering most of these questions to figure out like what the precedent is in said country or district. I just, I I mean, it, I can see how mathematically it makes sense, but I think in practical political terms, my understanding, like I I accept I could be getting it completely wrong here, but from my understanding of it, I I see a lot of problems here in practical terms. Yeah. But again, like in terms of fiction, to take it back into the realm of fiction, uh, problems are, Sometimes a good thing, you know. You can, oh yeah, you that's can, fair. You can that's analyze fair. them and like you can present yeah. a flawed system, um, and yeah, see see what the ramifications of said flawed system is. So um, yeah, I don't think people were in, intentionally <clears throat> trying to show us the most robust, wonderful systems ever. I think it was interesting systems, and I think this definitely constitutes as an interesting system. Yeah, well, no, they did say this is the best way to do merit based voting. Oh. Oh yeah, that would be the first line. Oh no, wait, the second line? No, where is it? The first line. The first line. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, anyway, but those, those are. Let us know in the sub what you think about uh, these various systems. Googleplex. Uh, feel Googleplex bite. Feel free to uh, elaborate more on the system. Be be really happy to hear from you. Um, For sure, definitely. Last thing uh, I want to talk about. Mm-hmm is, um, sorry, I'm doing an awful lot of talking here, but I swear I'll try and get over as fast as possible, is non-competitive sports. Um, Wait, I have, I have a thing left over to say. You do? Do you want to put it at the end of uh, non-competitive? No. Okay. about voting systems. Oh, voting systems. Go for it. It's Or it's related to this. Um, <clears throat> I want to, um, just to backtrack a tiny bit, Dominic pointed out that one of the suggestions made in the last episode, I said it would go against the separation of powers. Mm-hmm. and he said it could still work because it's not the only model to get a democracy. Separation of powers isn't the only model to get a democracy. And yeah, that's that's an entirely fair point. I should have been a bit clearer on that. It's it's a concept that we have in the modern West, but it's not like, you know, a, a universal yeah. necessity, Yeah, perhaps. Um, so thank you for, for calling me up on that. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, I took it as, with respect, you, what you were saying is with respect to our system of governments, like in Ireland, mm-hmm. what we experience, we would lose that. So, um, but yeah, you know, you're totally right. Uh, congratulations, Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, non-competitive sports. Um, so the last episode, I I called for a non-competitive sports, sports where um, the goal is not to beat another individual or team of people. And... I, I, I don't want to be offensive to artifacts yet, but I think... No, actually, no, this is my fault. I don't think I um, I explained it very well. I was 
like my intent was to look for uh, to have people write in about their made up sports um that they have created for their worlds or whatever um and tell us about them we got an awful lot of real life sports that were competitive which again totally my fault um but it was fun to kind of see that like there is an awful lot of kind of endeavors sure. in the real life that are ostensibly co- uh, cooperative which i never really thought of um mm-hmm. and those were really quickly we had ballet from uh you slash this account of this valid uh, and i can see that like i realize people wouldn't usually think of ballet as being a sport but it's definitely it's a physical cooperative group effort to to achieve something Right, exactly. And I thought that was really, it's a really cool way of looking at it. Um, a game called Taps. This comes from u slash uh, Curvy Cube. And Taps, if I, if I understand it correctly, it is kind of like keep it uppity, except you use your hands and not your feet. Um, it's like keep it uppity volleyball sort of thing. I might link a video in the, in the description if people are interested. Um, uh, dude, I don't think that came from Curvy Cube. Did it not? No. Oh, okay, let's get the correct source on that. Um, sorry, we need to clarify. Uh, Curvy Cube had suggested this sport, uh, but didn't know the name. And uh, Vulcan, Vulcan Trekkie 45 stepped in and offered up Taps, but we, we don't know if that was what Curvy Cube was, was talking about. But either way, I think Taps constitutes as a cooperative sport. And again, yep. I'll try and link a video in the description if you want to check it out. Um, we had return of Google Plex, a Google Plex bite uh, with tree aside football, which I'm going to dispute a little bit. Um, it is cooperative in the sense that there's three teams and you kind of have to like team up with another team uh, to like beat the third team. But there, it's, there still is that element of competition. Mm-hmm. And once the once the third team is eliminated, then it's one v one, and the object I assume is to win. Or, uh, or maybe it's it's to score less goals or or something. I don't know, but I, it feels it feels more competitive than cooperative uh, to me. But I know nothing about the sport. But just as a heads up, um, you slash being the hunt suggests cheerleading, uh, very much in a similar bit vein to ballet, uh, a physical group effort where the mm. object of the game is not to defeat anyone but to just master a routine of something that makes sense um, there are there are cheerleading competitions though I'm, I'm fairly sure yeah but there's music competitions but i wouldn't call music a sport okay yeah fair, uh, fair. and music is a also physical... cheerleading is hardcore it is cheerleading hard... well yeah they do all those pyramid things they're quite tricky like it's way more dangerous than football no really yeah because people fall off human pyramids and stuff <laughs> Huh. Apparently I wonder, so. I wonder what, like, where did this idea of cheerleading come from? Like, whose whose idea was? Do you know what we're going to do? We're going to form like like vertical two dimensional structures here. Like, why don't they just stay on the ground and wave the, the the bobbin things around? Like, who decided to go into the third dimension? I have no idea. I don't know. It seems like a weird one, especially like as as is related to sports. Like, you know, you, you like I, again, I could be entirely wrong. Uh, about American culture here, but I, I, I get the impression that cheerleading um, happened as a result of like regular sports. You know, you, you cheerlead as precursor to the sport. Mm-hmm. In which case, like what's with the, maybe it's just to create a big, like uh, to get the crowd going and kind of like wow them and awe them and prepare them for the thing. I don't know. I have no idea. Someone in America tell us why cheerleading. Um, Anyhow, you uh, slash uh, pig two zero seven uh, writes in hunting, uh, ostensibly hunting with other hunters. So you cooperate to to track down uh, an animal and uh, mm-hmm. all of this sort of jazz. I, I would I would argue that one is most definitely beating the animal in that regard. Uh, they may not be a sentient participant in the game, but they are a participant. <laughs> Um, it's it's competitive, but it's asymmetric. It's very it's very asymmetric, uh, and then I think the, the one of the best ones, well, actually the best one because it was a made up one, was via Doctor Who ten. We got this uh, from email, and it was uh, a game where a sentient avian species, um, basically flies really close to water, 
like you imagine almost like um say when swans take off they have this like their trajectory is very very close to the surface of water uh, the game is to to drag your feet in the water for as long as uh, possible without that drag dropping you into the water and uh, there's no beating anyone. It's purely uh, an idea of like you just it's just like showing off this thing. Um, and it, this comes from the fact that the species it, were prey and it, it, it comes from, you know, having to flee predators. And they made like this this culture, this sport rolls around this idea of uh, yeah fleeing predators and being the hunted and all this. And I thought that was really cool. Not not incredibly cooperative but certainly not combative. And I thought that was really cool. So props to Doctor Who 10. Hmm. Yeah? That's cool. It's, yeah. A cool. it's a very, very cool idea and very unique. Like I would, I've never in a month of Sundays would I have uh, taught to uh, create a water skimming uh, game played by a sentient species of bird. <laughs> I, I could see how it would very easily become a regular competitive sport though. Just like... Yeah, as in like... Uh, there's like world records for how long you can skim along the surface and you try to beat the other person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's fair. That's fair. But again, maybe, maybe given the fact that these creatures were prey, maybe it's not in their nature to think competitively. Maybe it's in their nature to think more, yeah, uh, yeah more uh, cooperatively, like as in we need to survive by cooperating and being non-aggressive and things like that. Um, yeah. But, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's fair. But I, I suppose once they become sentient, I'd imagine they'd quickly become uh, the predator. <laughs> I don't think there's any sentient species. Well, I would imagine there's no sentient species that is uh, prey. Like, in order to become sentient and dominant, I think you have to be the predator. So, I don't know. I don't know. But it's, it was a really good idea. I really enjoyed it. So this week, I say that every time. Yeah. Bill, Bill doesn't know the difference between weeks and months. It's just calendars, like there's. I wish someone would do <laughs> videos about calendars. <laughs> if only, if only, Bill. If, if only. <laughs> um. So this episode, I have written a short piece called "Report from the Frontier." Cool. Very good. Uh, who's who's the dude? Do we get a sign? We don't get a signed off thing. Okay. Cool. Uh, fire away, man. Praise to He who is as thunder. I report from the frontier of the northern province. Ten villages harboring remnants of the rebellion have been put to the spear, and their chattels claimed. These villages are currently empty, awaiting occupation by loyal settlers from the heartland. I have enclosed an accounting of all expenses and spoils from this season's expedition, prepared by the expeditionary clerk. In addition to the tribute due to he who is as thunder, I have apportioned to him a further four dozen cattle six dozen slaves and a chest of valuables in offering and gratitude. May his reign be long. Though this was expected to be the final punitive expedition in the campaign, I must bear troublesome reports of further unrest in the area. Suggestions of bin -ni traders descending from the interior and sowing dissent are further confirmed with each village we take. Informers and interrogated prisoners all report an unusual number of Bin Ni visitors in the months before the uprising, all speaking to known leaders of rebellion. The expeditionary force has not yet captured and interrogated any Bin Ni, nor indeed encountered any, excluding one incident I shall detail below. However, due to their increased visits in this land, we have gathered much more information about these people, which I believe may be useful to all expeditions in possessions adjacent to the interior, and perhaps ultimately to the interior itself. As is already understood, Bin Ni travel singly or in small groups, and are renowned for their ability to travel easily even in hostile terrain. Their activities in this land seem to confirm their hostility to the hegemony of He Who Is As Thunder. It is still believed that they have a language spoken among themselves, though when trading with other peoples they use tongues foreign. No prisoners or informants have yet revealed any knowledge of the Bin Ni tongue. The interrogation of provincial northerners suggests additionally that they have skills beyond their mercantile abilities or landscraft. Nearly all subjects insisted, even without torture, that all Bini possess magical abilities. Discounting these as provincial superstition, it is still worrying that it is a superstition repeated with great sincerity by several sources from diverse locations. 
The precise nature of these magical abilities is not certain. Many subjects claim that Binni possess the ability to transform their bodies into those of beasts. Others insist that they can travel great distances in mere steps. Yet others claim that they can exert control over the minds of humans. The one common claim is that the Binni possess a craft known by various names, not easily expressed in our tongue. An informant now attached to my staff renders it as underground astrology, though he stresses this is an incomplete translation. That all members of an interior peoples may be so gifted seems impossible. For a tribe to consist of hedge wizards rivaling our own court's magicians is a claim of patent foolishness. Yet it is so foolish that the truth it may be rooted in is yet troublesome. Concerning the singular encounter with the Binni, this occurred eight days ago, shortly before we left the penultimate village of our route. Scouts on the flanks of our procession ranged beyond a small hill and reported a sighting of a Binni encampment in a small valley below, two individuals without pack beasts. Upon hearing this information, I immediately set out, personally commanding two further detachments of scouts and a squadron of tusks. Reaching the hill from which they had been spied, no sign of their encampment was visible, and indeed the original scouts could not find any sign of the Binni in the valley. These scouts were faithful, loyal men, from the heartland of Katere, disinclined to drunkenness or ill-discipline. They have given me no reason to doubt the truth of their report, yet there was no camp in the valley and no spoor to follow. I have served for near three full terms in the armies of He Who Is As Thunder. My record, as you well know, is distinguished in his service. I have never been a commander weak to superstition, omen, or foolishness. I remind you of this to emphasize the gravity with which I tell you that I believe the Bin Ni possess crafts unknown to our nation. Further, they are a hostile tribe. Knowledge of these two facts will be of the utmost importance in planning further actions in this province and anywhere along the interior. Cool. Cool. I like that. Thank you. This is, this is the, just to pull back the curtain for the listeners, uh, Bill usually sends me a copy of what he's going to read beforehand and I glance over it and like think about questions to ask him. But this time I was like, no, I'm just going to listen to Bill talk and it's my first time experiencing the story. And that was class, man. The bit where the encampment was, was vanished was a real sort of like, oh, oh that's cool. <laughs> it's really cool. I really enjoy that. Thank you. Uh, I, have, Thank you. I have several questions, if, if that's okay. Shoot, shoot. Actually, I, I don't. I have two questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, what are what are tusks? Um. So they're kind of medium heavy infantry. Okay. All right. See, I was I was uh hoping you were going to say something like war elephants or something, but they're just people. Yeah. Yeah. They're 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 a, a, a kind of infantry. Um. And and the word this, tusks th- here is just is just a name. It has nothing to do with tusks. Uh, well, it, it does it kind of indirectly because Katere do use war elephants, but this was kind of it. it this it w- would have been impractical to have them on this kind of expedition. Oh, okay, okay. And, and uh, what what setting are we in here? Are we in Handwavia? We are back at Handwavia. Okay. Um. So, oh, Bill can be able to talk about stuff. This is excellent. <laughs> um. What is underground astrology? That is a. As craft practiced by the Bin Ni, the details of which I'm not going to reveal just yet. Oh, oh. Jesus, we're in hand wave and he's still kind of... <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't want to give it give it up give it all away up front. It's um yeah, like it's a it's it's a thing that the Bin Ni have. It's a it's a practice or a, a magic perhaps that they have, um, which oh. is not known outside the bit the Bin Ni. I'm assuming underground, the, the, the words underground astrology are meant to be descriptive. Um, so I don't, I don't understand whether or not under, underground should be taken literally or metaphorically. As in like the underground, like to not be mainstream, to be underground or literally. Oh no, no, no. Literally like subterranean. So subterranean astrology. Okay, so... Hang on now. But bear in mind, bear in mind, it's an awkward translation. 
It is, it is. But surely, uh, if you, if one were to try and parse what those words meant in context, one would get somewhere close to it, but maybe not understand the nuances. Um, uh, let me, let me, let me think for a second. Astrology. Astrology is the study of the heavens uh, and how they impact life. Um, like how the motions of stars can be predictive of future and things like that. So if you're underground, if you're literally subterranean, what would be the subterranean analogy for looking up at the heavens, heavens and divining magic from that? Jesus H. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's really tough, man. That's really bloody cryptic. <laughs> It certainly is. <laughs> that's terrible. All right. Um, uh, that's, that is terrible because those were my questions. Because, yeah. Um, but, cl- but clearly, clearly, right. Clearly this. Um, well, no, it's not clearly because you always do this ducking and weaving in your writing. This underground astrology, I was about to say, is limited. It, it includes uh, being able to change into beasts. Um, and that sort of jazz, and ostensibly vanishing uh, out in midair, sort of jazz. Um, but that just could be Floyd Narrator stuff again, like, and people, Chinese whisper sort of stuff. So there's no fucking clue as to what this underground astrology is, which, which is annoying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you got anything, anything inside, uh, inside baseball stuff you want to share? Um, so, uh, Yes, this is a return to Handwavia, mm-hmm. um, to the planet of Handwavia itself. Yes. And Katere is a, is a nation we've encountered before. Katere, which is ruled by he who is as thunder, is the, the nation that was exploring Lamo. Yeah, way back when, isn't it? Uh, about a year ago. Yeah, th- that's when we had the scout guy. Who was all yes. like, yeah, genocide, yeah, yeah. And, and then isn't the thing where there was a magician in a court somewhere? Yes. That that yes. was also, that's that's also halfway with it, but Explicitus is also part of this sort of narrative. Uh, well, this this is no longer in Nlamo. This is in uh, the kind of, the, the lands adjacent to, which have been conquered by Katere. And Nlamo, sorry, Nlamo and Katere are quite far apart. Oh, okay, okay. Katere so... is on the eastern side of the continent, and Kater- and Namo is the is a kind of a large region in the south of the continent, the, the very the very south of the continent. Okay, okay, but it's the same. It's the same power that the same power that was sending that scout into Nalamo is con- has conquered Katere. No, Katere is the conqueror. Kateri is the, sorry yeah okay right Kateri is the con- yes okay yes got it got it Kateri is the conquering nation and so this these Bini people mm-hmm. uh, who are who are they and what do they do are they a separate nation they are a separate nation they live in the interior of the continent um so I don't know if you remember when we were talking about Namo the first place I described was the village of Kapa. Yes. Oh God. Yeah, I do remember that. It's such a long and time ago. And that was the that was the the very kind of northern limit of um of Namo. That was like the northern limit of the of Tenshas domain. Hmm. Um, and beyond that was the interior, which was like a, the highland, this kind of vast highland on the inside of the continent. Okay. Which which the other nations don't access, and which the the Bini live on, and they they kind of are nomads, and they come down and they trade among the the other nations. Okay, cool, cool. And so, uh, Kateri are obviously in the process of conquering the Bini because they're having problems with them. Or have they conquered with them? No, they've conquered. They, they have not. They have not. They have, conquered, they have conquered lands adjacent to the interior, but they haven't uh, made expeditions into the interior itself. Okay, okay, cool. The um, interior, for, for anyone who's not reading it, is like is capitalized here. It's, it's, a, it's not just, it doesn't just mean the inside. It is a kind of a reasonably well-defined area. Which mm. happens to be the on the inside of the continent, mm-hmm. and yeah, so that's just me expanding, expanding what's happening in the kind of main hand wavy planet a bit more. So, so from from a geopolitical standpoint, uh, can I just mm-hmm. uh, interrogate this a bit? So, yeah, of course. Kateri had looked to conquer Nalamo, yes. 
it, yeah, the, the previous kind of little arc that I had was uh, a military, well, sort of a military slash diplomatic expedition to Nlamo that was scoping it out with the intention of eventually conquering it or, you know, see how feasible it would be to conquer. And uh, I'm, do, can I, would I be correct in assuming that they have not now conquered Nlamo uh, and instead they're turning their their attention to Bini? No. No. Separate. Separate. Sep- so they're, they're... Concepts. Okay, so are, wait, are they trying to conquer both? Basically what I'm getting at I mean, is, it, is... Yeah, like they're, they're an aggressively expansivist, expansionist kind of empire. Okay, okay. And do, would there any sort of real world analog here? Like, are we talking Mongol? Mongol-like, where it's just kind of like we will continue to just expand like crazy amounts or something more confined? Any any um, analogy in the real world? Not, nothing as fast as the Mongols. Okay, cool. Uh, what about sea uh, sea stuff? Like, uh, how is their naval their navy? Because we've heard we know the Lamo is in the south, right? And we know mm-hmm. the interior is the, the interior. Uh, uh, and we know this Bini place is you said to to just adjacent to Kateri. And they, that all sounds very land based. What's their navy like? Uh, well, they do. They did sail to Lamo. Um, they didn't oh, march okay, so over land because there there are other nations in between which Katere have not conquered. Okay, okay, cool. Um, cool, interesting. Have you got a but they map don't of this engage area? in? Uh, I I drew a map of what would eventually become the setting years ago, like over a decade ago, and I don't. I'm, I think I have it around somewhere, but I don't know where. Um, I would probably change it significantly were, were I to find it again. But I, ha- I have an idea of how things are laid out roughly. Okay, okay. Uh, man, it'd yeah. be a good idea to see the map. It'd be really interesting to see what's going on. Because mm-hmm. um, I feel like we've, t- we've, we've gathered enough information from your setting to be able to like to be able to have a narrative and then it'd be cool like in a fantasy book to flick to the front and look at the map and be all like, oh, that's where all the various different <laughs> places are. Um, that'd yeah. be really cool. Yeah, um, and uh, I suppose final thing, uh, I assume, I assume the Bene have genuine magical powers, uh, so but do I. it's always worth asking, you, so do you, okay, well I was going to say, uh, it's always <laughs> worth asking, is this reliable, reliable narrator sort of stuff, or is this just kind of like, uh, Katere are always in the wrong place at the wrong time to get the wrong impression? I I expect that there is something... No, there, there, there is something going on with the Bini. There is something other going on with the Bini. Okay, cool. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, any um, final points? Let me think. Uh, mm, I want to make it clear that the Bini and Lamo are separate, just in case that wasn't clear. Um, yeah. Yeah, cool. And the, the interior stretches down to the northern end oh I said that already to the northern end of Lamo um, and yeah. the the Bini are present in Lamo as well that's actually something I mentioned in the first the first thing I wrote in Kappa was that Bini traders oh. do visit there well, what's the relationship between Bini and Lamo um, Bini go there to trade it's particularly like anywhere that is lies along the interior, they'll they'll come down and they'll trade with with uh, whatever people in Lamo are there. Um, but not the Bini aren't a kind of a specific nation as such. They're they're just more like an ethnicity. Okay, okay. There isn't a king of the Bini. There isn't a Bini country. It's just they are a people who inhabits this region. They don't have a polity as such, or a kingdom. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But but an individual Benin's uh, attitude towards the Lamo would be non-hostile. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they've they've no they've no particular beef with people in general. Um, they they've no real connection to the Tesha, who's the the king of Lamo that I, I described before. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't interact with him much because he tends to be further in the south where they, they don't go a lot. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, I like. It's good. 
It's good. Uh, a map. A map will be a map will be most useful. I'll consider it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Uh, yeah, cool. So, uh, people, go to Bill's blog. This is going to be on Bill's blog, and uh, you can yeah. check it out. It'll be up on my Tumblr. Your t- I keep forgetting it's a Tumblr. Um, yeah, cool. Sh- shall we move on to tents? Certainly. Okay, so Tense English Has No Future is a video that I made about uh, a week or two ago. Um, we usually try mm-hmm. to record the podcast straight after I release the video um, so we can talk about it uh, in a timely manner. But Bill decided to uh, have a life outside of uh, the Art Effects Corporation and he, he went away for, for a week and hence why we're a little bit late uh, to the table with this. But regardless, we're going to talk uh, tense. Uh, before I uh, get into all the points I'd like to talk about, uh, have you watched the video, Bill? And if so, what do you think? I have and, watched the video. And please give me all of your uh, nitpicky questions. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed the video. Oh, good. It was very cool. I liked seeing the the, the different approaches from uh, languages other than English. Um, I have a couple of questions. Oh, Jesus, a couple. Oh, Christ. Okay, that's batting down the hatches. Right. Okay, go for it. Well, I've, I've several. Oh, um, Jesus. <laughs> so, you say English has a has two tenses. Yes. Because it marks for uh, past and non-past. Is that right? Yes. No. Yeah, past and non-past. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the, they don't have verbal forms for other things. So, what are... What is the name for tenses like English's future tense or perfect tense or whatever okay. like that aren't morphologically marked? How yeah. do you describe those verb those so, tenses? So they're called uh, the idea of putting in auxiliary verbs. Or first of all, they're auxiliary verbs like the will and the am going to. And all, that's an auxiliary verb, and that's called a peri right. periphastic construction or periphrastic construction. Um, and that is the terminology. And periphrastic. Yeah, as opposed to being like uh, cool. morphological, it's a periphrastic thing. And also, they are they are more like aspects and moods, like w- w- than they are tenses. Like when you think about like I will go to the shop, that will to us implies future, but also there is a fair mm-hmm. bit of like uh, intent. Do you know what I mean? Like there there is a school of thought that says that the present tense. In, in in the future tense in English is essentially the present tense with some sort of conviction put on it. Like I am currently saying that I <laughs> I want to go in the future. Like it's not a true future thing. Yeah. Um, so that's that's what that is. I will note actually at this point before we go on to another point is that this is a hotly debated topic, and I have found a couple of sources that said that we simply don't know what English does. Like there, it, the the jury is kind of out on this. But I didn't mention this in the video because I went just with what your man uh, Bernard Comrie says in his work, Tense. I'll put links in the show notes because uh, he is a linguist. I am not. And I'm not willing to rock the boat uh, on a contentious topic on this. So it's not it's not in, like really cut and dry as to what's going on with English. But it's certainly not a simple past, present, future, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Satisfa- okay. Satisfactory answer. And that... That's satisfactory, and it, it it links up nicely with the next thing I was going to ask. Excellent. About the the way that English has past and non-past. Mm-hmm. Um, there's actually t- two ways to talk about the, or two common ways come to mind to talk about the future. Mm-hmm. One is what you said there that um auxiliary verb per- periphrastic construction of I will go. Mm-hmm. And the other is to just use the present tense. I am going. I'm not going right now. I'm going tomorrow. That's using the the non past. Actually, yeah. it's it's constructing it exactly like present tense, just putting in a particle. I suppose that's kind of like what you said about Jamaican Creole. Yeah, it's a little bit. Now, I don't know. You're... I don't know linguistically if that's what's going on. Like it, it literally becomes almost tense, tenseless, and adverbs are used. I don't know, but yeah, you're dead right. It sounds it sounds fierce, uh, present tensey, doesn't it? Which? Uh, the I'm going tomorrow. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it is. Like, I, you know, if, if I'm if I'm in a car, I can say I am driving, like I'm currently driving. But if I'm going somewhere tomorrow, I could say I'm driving tomorrow. You know, it's, it's exactly the same construction. Just you put an extra thing into it to yeah. put it yeah. in the future. Yeah. 
which you know before doing this um, video i had i didn't really have a clue about this um and it kind of is a little bit mind-blowing that we have this system because it just makes no sense <laughs> to me like i get that we all function fine on it but surely the french and spanish way of past present future is just so much easier like it's crazy that we have this and we, we don't even think about it as english speakers like it's most english speaker, speakers especially in the comments below the video they were kind of like i did not understand how i didn't even realize that this is a thing and it like we just assume it to be normal but it's like so abnormal it's crazy but but german is is the same it does it with an auxiliary verb doesn't it it does yeah yeah i use, i'm just using english because that's what uh ich werde, yeah yeah um yeah well, yeah, I mean that, that. I mean, I guess that's why it's it's because we are most closely we're a Germanic language, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I guess I assume then most Germanic languages. Oh, I don't oh, know. I'm going to Google this. I don't know. I I believe I could be wrong, but I believe most Romance languages are past, present, future. So it could be a case that Germanics are um, have a binary distinction. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, there is no simple or morphological future tense as such. Yeah, in most Germanic languages, yeah. according to three seconds on Wikipedia. Good old Wikipedia. Um, Good next old question. Wikipedia. Number question number three. Um, do any languages that you are aware of have simple verbal forms for complex relative clauses? So, like, oh Jesus, okay. future in future are perfect in future oh. but just do that simply morphologically without expressing it you know through auxiliary verbs and clauses and things uh i don't i don't have any languages to hand uh, I'm, tr okay. I'm trying to think were there any examples in in the in the book in tense there might have been. I, I don't want to say that there isn't because I'm probably going to be wrong with that, but I'm leaning towards mm -hmm. uh, there is not, and most of them tend to use auxiliary verbs. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm incredibly open to correction on that one there. Okay. Um, I've also written down habitual be, and I can't remember exactly what I was going to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the, the habitual, like that's, that's a mood. So that that is a thing. That's a mood. Oh, or is it an aspect? I'm sorry. Okay. I, okay, it's it, it's not it's not tense. Like a, the habitual thing is to, to do more aspect and mood, and it's going to be talked about uh, in a separate video. Um, it's it's a different okay. thing. It's not solely um, a tense related thing. But like I said at the start of the video, the three aspects, like tense, aspect, and mood, they're so intertwined, and half the time it's like it's mm -hmm. hard to pick them apart. Um, because they they tend to be hard baked together, uh, but yeah, that the habitual nature of verbs is going to be covered in a in a, another video for definite. Okay, cool. 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 Are those are those the questions? Um, I think so. Jesus, um, man, that, that was that was that was not as, as bad. I always get really sweaty when you're like, I have questions I'm like. Sh fuck, I'm not a linguist. <laughs> Crap, but I think I did well. I'm there. really sweaty because. I'm really sweaty because I'm upstairs and there's a heat wave in Ireland and I have the windows open, but I can't open them too much because the way the sun would, would then be in my eyes and it's very, very warm here. I have no windows open and I'm encased in a fort made out of cloth. It is incredibly warm. I considered taking off clothes before we started back recording, but then I was like, Bill would think less of me. I'm not going to do that. You wouldn't have to tell me. And also I wouldn't think less of you. Yeah, I don't know. Well, <laughs> I, I that's fair, but it's also shocking on profession. Can you imagine if a co-worker, like, I don't know, you worked in... Uh, McDonald's is a bad example because it's the food industry, but let's just run with it. But imagine if a co-worker was just like, I'm going to take off my top now. And it's just like, yeah, sure, whatever, you do you. It's like, no, <laughs> we, we don't do that. Or like, you're I mean, sitting... You didn't have to see them. Yeah, that's fair. Well, but you know, but Bill, I know I appreciate this all hangs on whether or not I tell you and I don't have to, but, it, but you know, if I did tell you, You'd know that I was... You don't see me, but you'd know that I was quasi-naked. And I'm assuming that would not make for... Be, be conducive for a great pod, podcast. Edgar, we live together. We have very few secrets. That's fair. Yeah, yeah. Man, <laughs> it has been... We'll get back to tense in a second, but it occurred to me the last day. Um, I began evaluating how time has, has run for the past number of years. Because every so often you need to be kind of like... Like, how far am I removed from X event? And it, it came up with, with you. And I was like, it's been... 
It's been so many years since we lived together. It feels not so long ago, but it's like... Five. It's like five years. It's half a decade since we lived together. Like, that's mental. Yeah. Like, it's absolutely crazy. I probably it, wouldn't even recognise you if I met you anymore. N- no, it's not like you see me on the internet all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and occasionally in person. I saw you last month. <laughs> that That's fair. That's fair. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's been crazy. It's craziness. Anyway, anyway, let's get back to this. I, I have some points about tents that I need to bring up. Um, uh, corrections uh, that uh, I need to make are I, I messed up the French the French is wrong I'm very sorry to the internet uh, I swapped the past and the present so I said that the French present is its past and I said that the French past is its present it's not it's swapped um, so I'm really sorry and the, the thing that it's it's so sickening about this is that I, I talked to a French speaking friend of mine and was like, hey, I get roasted a lot on the internet for not getting uh, foreign languages correct. I need I need you to give me this, right? And I was like, I need a past, present, future forms of the verb I eat. And she's like, fine. And she lists them off to me in text. And I was like, great. To be clear, that's past, present, future. And I did not put in the word respectively. And so she just goes, yes, it's past, present, future. And I was thinking in that order, but she did not think this. And so there was a mix up in communications and I was like, yes, I've got it confirmed from a native French speaker that the past, present, future are X, Y, and Z when that was not the case. And it was so frustrating when it happened and people started correcting me. I was like, God damn it. Like I, I went to the source. I went to, I went for primary sources. And even then, like fate finds a way of tripping you up. And it's like, God, oh, so I'm very sorry, internet. Uh, so as usual, it's all someone else's fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I would say it's my fault for not being very clear, but but anyways. Uh, and then another uh, language uh, correction uh, thing I need to bring up is I got the Jamaican Creole wrong. Um, the transcription mm-hmm. is, is correct, uh, but my pronunciation is not correct because I could not find IPA for it. So I just, I basically read what I thought it would be. Uh, but apparently, according to internet, uh, internet, the word yesterday in Jamaican Creole is not yes side but rather Yesi Day, which makes sense. Okay. <laughs> so it should be I, Yesi... I can see how that would happen. Exactly, yeah. So it should be Yesi Day Mia Sing, uh, is how you would say yesterday I sang in, in Jamaican Creole. Um, so again, I apologize for that, but like th- that error is like, there was no stopping that error. Like I couldn't find a native uh, Jamaican uh, Patois or Creole speaker. Like it just wouldn't happen. So I'm sorry, internet, but... We need to get those corrections on record. Um, and then two final points, if I may. Or do you have anything to add? Uh, I don't think so, no. Okay. Uh, uh, a penultimate point is a lot of people, a lot of people were like, I wonder what would happen if time travel was a factor in your world and how that might play a part in tenses. Assuming that time travel has been around long enough for language to encode it uh, in, in its in its uh, in its grammar, and like I thought about this, mm-hmm. and I came to a rather like like um, boring conclusion, and I just want to see if you agree with it. I think n- nothing would happen. Like I, I think it would be the same. Like I- imagine like tomorrow, Bill. I say I'm going to get in my time machine, and I want to go back to the 1950s. Like mm-hmm. you would you would just say something like. I will be going to the 1950s, which is correct. There will be a time in the future where you will be going back to the 1950s. There's no need for... I see no reason why a a language should grammaticalize that process when past, present, future suffices to locate events in time regardless of whether or not time travel exists. Agree? What do you intend to do in the 1950s? Uh, I I, I don't know. Um, uh, what what do people in the nineteen fifties do? Wear a lot of hair gel. Um. Okay, so <laughs> when you go to the nineteen fifties, you will wear a lot of hair gel, or you will have worn a lot of hair gel. Because I could see a, I could see two a, a way of dealing with it here that you dis- distinguish grammatically between subject of time and object of time. So it may be oh. in your subjective future, but it's actually in the past. It would be cool to mark that. Okay. 
Yeah, interesting. Do do you think that there is a no? Niece... That's a, that's assuming a, a single consistent timeline. Like it, it depends on how your your time travel works. Um, yeah, that's fair. If it was more complex than that, then maybe you'd need you'd need further things. But I'm sure you could get around that with relative clauses and such. Um, do I think there's a need for it? Yeah. Do you think there's a need for it? Like again, that's that's great. That's a cool system. But can one? Uh, deal with time travel just using past, present, and future. I mean, technically, we do this in time travel films all the time. We don't invent a new, a new tense to to deal with temporal elements. So, what's your thoughts there? You can, but you can also talk about the past without morphologically inflecting the verb. That doesn't mean that it mightn't happen anyway. What you can also talk about the past without morphologically inflecting, as in without morphologically inflecting it to for your subjective objective. D- division? No, no. It, we're ignore. We're, let's not. Let's not talk about time travel at all right now. Okay. You're saying would we need this? Mm. And I'm saying we wouldn't need it. But we also don't need to change the the verb right. in order to talk about the past in English. You could say I walk yesterday. Yes, and it's yeah, yeah. understandable. Yeah. yeah but we that's... still do say I walked yesterday. We still do change the verb. So while it might not be necessary, that doesn't mean that it couldn't happen. Yeah, okay, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Um yeah, yeah. Um I I like um, and I, you know, it sorry. may be necessary depending on how a uh, uh, a society with time travel functions. Maybe it would be necessary to to have that amount of or it would be helpful perhaps to have that amount of um information encoded into the language. Hmm. Uh, last point that I want to bring up is a a tense system that um, uh, Comrie um, hints at uh, in 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 the book that doesn't exist. But it, I don't know why he brings it up. He's just kind of like, wouldn't it be cool if? Which I thought was kind of like that's a bit of weird weird thing to say in in a in an academic work. Stealth conlanging. You what? Stealth. Stealth. He's stealth conlanging. <laughs> <laughs> he is. Uh, and this was the idea that uh, you could have a, a morphological tense that refers to a past, like, epoch, like a special time in the past that is culturally revered. And I think maybe a good uh, illustrative example of this would be if a language spoken in Avatar The Last Airbender has a morphological tense that specifically refers to a time prior to there being an Avatar. So like back in like the age of spirits or whatever. Um, and like, again, if you have like a, a cultural notion of like time is cyclical and, you know, you live the form you now take also inhabited that special time. But, and because that time is so revered in culture, it would get specially inflected and all this. I thought that was really interesting. Really, really cool. Again, I don't think this happens in, in, um, in uh, natural languages. Uh, I believe a lot of people think that the Aboriginal languages, uh, some Aboriginal languages, have something like this, but I think that's contentious. Uh, so I don't know, mm. but I think I think it's cool. I think it's a really cool idea, and I think it's uh, a hell of a lot of world building can be done with that notion. I think. Yeah. Um, what's that? What that's making me think of is the the distinction between eternal and sempiternal. What? Um, sempaternal? What the so, hell is a sempaternal? Uh, okay, I'm going to gonna take me a second to find this now. Right, take um, your time. Okay. So, eternal implies something that is infinite outside the bounds of time, like God. Mm-hmm. Whereas sempaternal is an, a more earthbound way to talk about forever. This is just from vocabulary.com. So, they they both have... Well, sempaternal has infinite duration, whereas eternal exists outside the concept of duration, sort of. Okay, okay. So that's two different ways of conceiving of infinite time. One which is bound by time, but is infinite. Another which is not bound by the concept of time at all. One is one is all time, and one is not bound by time. Yeah, the... That's kind of a separate thing to the thing I was talking about because uh, we do have some cases of language. I'm really going to butcher this part because it didn't make the script for the very reason that I don't understand it very well, but I'll give it my best crack here. 
Um, there are languages that have the concept of eternal time, as you frame it, uh, but I think linguists refer to it as like universal time, where it's this idea of like time is this thing outside of time, and mm -hmm. morphologically it's treated like that, and uh, it almost functions like a tenseless language in that other words then uh, are brought in to take universal time and pin it into our time frame, if you know what I mean. Um, so that's slightly no. different, I think, from the idea of having a uh, not not a like a universal or eternal time, but like a de defined time that is in our timeline that is just considered culturally special. Do you know? Right. Because again, like, okay, it, it, I was think. Sorry, I guess I see. I see your point. I was just thinking maybe kind of sort of sideways, like a, like time of another realm, not interacting with our time, something like that. <laughs> I, I, that would be also cool, and that the, totally, and that could be totally cool. But I think the idea of the special period uh, tense it could could even be like there is a special tense for referring to when Jimmy Carter was in office in the states. Like it could, could even be like that. Do you know what I mean? Like as tied to our our reality and our timeline uh, as that. Just something where the culture is mm -hmm. latched on and they they exonerate this 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 period, and as such, it creeps into uh, yeah. the grammar of a language. And rightly so. Do, do we like Jimmy Carter? Well, he's the only United States president who was ever attacked by a rabbit that we know of, so. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure, like, I appreciate that Pence is not a president, but I'm, I'm pretty sure Pence's rabbit at some stage would have attacked Pence. Like, it's got to happen. Like, I've been attacked by Pence Ooh. before, and he owns a pet rabbit. He's got he's, he's to have been attacked by Marilyn but he's Bundle. not the president that that that's fair and it that. happened it happened during jimmy carter's presidency that's the important thing it was wasn't he... just like he was a person who was once attacked by a, by a rabbit who became president no a president attacked sorry no no the other way around a <laughs> rabbit attacked the president of the united states did did this rabbit attack the president of the united states in like uh, like was it a wild rabbit that did this, or was in, he... in, in his official capacity as president? I don't know. Um, yeah, it was a wild rabbit. It was a wild rabbit. Okay, why did why did Carter have yeah. occasion to be around wild rabbits? He was on a trip, like he was he was fishing or hunting or something in a swamp, and a rabbit attacked his boat. Uh, the rabbit attacked the boat while he was fishing. Apparently so. Like an aquatic Apparently rabbit, so. or like he, or he was. Or he do, was like tracking through a, through a swamp. He was going somewhere or something. He was in a, he was in like a swamp, and a swamp rabbit attacked him. Do rabbits swim? Is that a thing rabbits do? Yeah, rabbits, most animals can swim. I think. Yes, but like like I I mean cats can swim, but I I, I get the impression cats prefer not to go in water. Like I think I get they can all swim, but like is it a common thing for rabbits to be found in aquatic biomes? Well, it was it was in a swamp, so I guess this one was. Man, even the idea of a of a rabbit being in a swamp sounds like incongruous to me. Like they do, they strike me as like prairie animals, like like in the grasslands, not in a swamp. That's mad. Like that's crazy. Um, mm -hmm. But yay, Jimmy Carter. <laughs> <laughs> and that, um, that's why his his presidency should be the golden age that you're talking about. I. Well, I'm finished work now for this. Well, I'm finished te teaching for the summer, so I'm only working away on my own stuff. Um, I was just at a chamber music festival in Bantry, which is in the the west of Cork, which is the southwest of Ireland, which I go to every year. Uh, and I had I, a very the, good time. We have brought this up on the podcast before because I think I we talked about it last time you were there. I think I did. But for those who for those who uh, are not familiar with classical music. Chamber music is like a small ensemble, like a, a few instruments together playing. So it's not solo yeah. works and it's not big orchestra. It's just small groups um, yeah. uh, playing together. String quartets, for example. Is the probably the canonical chamber music sort of thing. But it can get really weird because uh, like you could have like a violin, two, two synths and a poet could also be described as chamber music it could yeah um so anyhow anyhow uh any fun stories from bantry anything anything of note um i went for a swim in the sea twice which i don't oh. usually do i like i've been ages since i've gone for swim in the sea yeah 
I, I don't see you as a person who swims. The idea of Bill swimming is very odd. Oh, thanks. How kind of you to say. <laughs> um, I, I would like to be better at swimming, but I find it very hard to pace myself when I swim. I just kind of get in and I go really quickly and I can't slow down or take it easy because I, you know, I'm in the water, so I'm definitely going to drown immediately. Um, mm. So I tire very quickly and that makes it hard to actually get good at it. But, uh, well, okay, when I say I went for a swim, I went for sort of a wade more than a swim. Um, but it was very nice. And I touched a jellyfish, which was very exciting. I, I'm going to assume the non-poisonous uh, form. Apparently, it this one actually can sting you, but it's really difficult to get it to sting you. <laughs> huh. Uh, yeah. Do jellyfishes feel like they look? Uh, yes, kind of. Like I didn't, I didn't pick it up. It was just it was swimming towards me, and I gently poked it out of the way. Hmm. Jellyfishes are jellyfy are terrifying creatures. Like Do you they are, yeah, they are Cthulhu right there. They are mini Cthulhu's swimming around in in the sea. I no, I'm jellyfish. Yeah, I'm, jellyfish are dead to me. Hate them. These ones, these ones are cool looking. They were they're called moon jellyfish. And they're small and sort of a translucent white, but they've got four purple rings inside them. Moon jellyfish. Um. Oh wow! Yeah, that look that does look pretty cool. It look they look fierce vapor wave. <laughs> they do a bit, don't they? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's mad. I wouldn't. Yeah, I'd never. I would never touch one of them. Just be like that. I'm good. I'm done. Um, you would just, you would just yeah. have gotten out of the sea. Uh, to be fair, to be fair, man, I can't swim, so I wouldn't be in the sea anyways. Um, I have no interest in swimming in the sea. Uh, I have no interest in swimming. Um, no interest in touching jellyfish. These are all things that I'm just like, nope. Well, it was very oh, very up. warm. It was very very warm the day I got down, so I went for a swim that evening, and it was very cold water, which was nice. And then I went for a swim in one of the mornings at like half eight in the morning. And the wow. day hadn't the day hadn't gotten warm yet, so it was extremely cold in the sea. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. How was the festival itself? The festival itself was good. It's actually it's finishing today. I wasn't able to stay down for all of it, unfortunately. Oh. Um I usually I usually volunteer there every year, so I I volunteered for as much of it as I was down for this time. But uh, yeah, I saw mm-hmm. some absolutely brilliant music. Uh, discovered some some new works that I didn't really know. And saw some stuff that I did know but hadn't heard in a while, and it has a it has a really really high standard of performer, so mm-hmm. that's it's it's always it's great to go to to see some world class people at it, and cool. I would recommend it. Um, of interest maybe to to some of the some of our listeners, there was mm-hmm. a a vocal group that I saw there. They're just called Voice. They're a trio. I think they're based in London. And they've been to the festival a few times, but I went to some of their concerts this year and they sing in a variety of languages. So they did some stuff in medieval French and some stuff in Occitan and they did a song in Judeo-Spanish. Hold on now, the last two, what are they? Occitan is a language from France. It's kind of, I think it's kind of related to Catalan. Maybe I'm pronouncing mm. it wrong. It might be Occitan. Hold on. I'm going to check Wikipedia here for the IPA for that. Um, Occitan. Sorry. Occitan. Um, okay. Yeah. So it's a, it's a language from, from southern France. It's not um, as widely spoken um, as it used to be because France is like that. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's related to Catalan. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And then the uh, last one? Judeo-Spanish is a is the language of a lot of Sephardic Jews who were in uh, North Africa and Spain and things and around the Ottoman Empire. So it's got a lot of uh, Hispanic influence in it. Um, it's, oh. it's kind of like, you know, the way uh, Yiddish is a Jewish language that draws heavily on German. Uh, I didn't, but yes. 
Okay, well, that's what Yiddish is. Um, right. And so this is a similar thing, but just from a different area, from the... I, I think it originates in Iberia. Um, and this is actually quite common in uh, Jewish communities ar- around the world. As far as I remember, I remember listening to a podcast about it, is that, that they they have their own languages that are kind of connected to the ones surrounding them but are separate are, are different mm. and um have more influence from from other places as well there's a the ask historians podcast has an episode about it oh cool i will i'll see if i can find it and link in the in the show notes mm-hmm. um so yeah that was really good and i got i got talking to one of the singers about it and the they they get really into the pronunciation. Like they, they go and they, they have to learn new orthographies and look up the IPA for these languages. Because medieval French, that the, or at least the stuff that they were singing, has a pronunciation very different to modern French. So it was it's essentially like trying to read Chaucer with modern orthography. It doesn't sound right. Um, yeah. So they have to go off and they have to learn the orthography and how to sing it. And it makes a big difference to, to how it sounds when you sing it, which is pretty cool. I'm going to work on the assumption here that the they sing uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for uh, pieces from that period. They're not just like translating anything into these languages. They're actual pieces from those periods in those languages. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, like, I think, I think these languages are. I, I assume Ossetan. No, Ossetan is definitely still spoken. Sorry, I assume Judeo Spanish still has still has um, speakers. Um, that group needs to change their name. It is, or or maybe they're just not on on YouTube at all. But uh, searching voice, even voice vocal trio, just gives you a whole load of the voice, and mm-hmm. it's just like you're never going to find them. Um, if I can find, terrible. if I can so, find them uh, on I'll, YouTube, I'll uh, I'll send you some to stick in the show notes. Yeah, do because I I genuinely do think that there will be people listening that would enjoy that like and i would certainly enjoy that so that'd be really cool to see uh, or to listen to rather mm-hmm. um before we go unless you've anything t- to add and stuff i'd like to talk about slash complain about attack on titan a little bit go for it but i think we brought this up on the show before uh, about attack on titan and i think if i recall correctly i said something like i've watched a handful of episodes mm-hmm um, but I never finished it and now I'm trying to finish it and I have made it I, th- I think maybe three quarters of the way through the first season um, as we're recording and uh, I have thoughts and complaints that I'd like to air if that's okay sure I actually I have also got had in the past some thoughts and complaints I'm going to find them because I'm posting on Facebook about them so you shoot there while I look for these cool uh, okay so thoughts is I do not get it I don't actually understand why this is an anime that's held in such high regard. Like, it's not bad. Like, it's certainly not bad. But I don't understand why, when this was released, it blew up and everyone's like, oh, it's the best thing ever. I, I, I don't get that. Um, the pacing, I find, like, a little bit difficult to deal with sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very, very slow. It's very slow. It's very, very slow. And uh, the they seem to... Now, I haven't got to the point where things resolve yet, not having finished the se- first season. Um, but they seem to just, like, be continuously introducing things and never actually, like, like explaining them or anything. You know, they just kind of, like, here's a new thing about this world. It's like, okay, great. But, like, you have to, like, wrap this up a little bit. like. And I find myself having tons of questions about, like, you know, how does... Uh, spoilers, by the way. Uh, how does Eren become the thing, become uh, the titan. Mm. Uh, what did the father do? Um, general stuff about how the setting works. And there's an awful lot that's presented without any sort of like like context. And I, that's it's a little bit infuriating to me. The voice acting is it's just, it's so shouty. It's yeah. so screamy. Like, and even when they're not like in battle or whatever, like they're, when there's a need to scream, they're just saying normal things like, I'm going to get bread. And they're like, I'm going to get bread. And it's like so loud and harsh. And it's like, Jesus, stop. Uh, and the final thing, the biggest thing that I find very difficult to, to watch is the constant and re- unrelentless soliloquies where characters 
talk about their feelings uh but like to the backdrop of like still images kind of like fading in and out like i cannot stand that like he like i don't know like let's just say aaron aaron trans uh, transforms into the titan tra- uh, d- collapses back from the titan and he's all like was that me what will people think of me who am i what is it and you're like i don't care like don't say these things like why do you why do you need to explain this crap to us can you not show us that through images like in saying like what will people think of me like because i'm this quasi titan you don't need to use those words you could just show pictures of people being horrified or confused looking it's so so wordy in those sections and i just i just i don't care i I don't care about that whatsoever um those are my complaints uh if you found your thing uh on facebook jump in here if not i'll continue with uh with some good points um, um, so, so, so what, what you got there? What, what's happened? What's the last thing that happened? Where you are? Like what uh, episode have you gotten up oh to? Geez, the last. I I don't know what episode because of autoplay on on Netflix. So that who knows? Uh, but they have. Uh, it's, it's easy the, to find out. <laughs> it is. It is. But hold on, I can just tell you what happened the last episode. I believe the last episode was they. Uh, went to see the captured titan the captured titan died and we met this new character who seems like a a, a super nerd uh, and really likes titans or likes studying titans they've just arrived at this castle outside of the walls um okay. that's where i'm at i forgot a lot of this so they, they've been outside the walls have they encountered that thing they encounter in the forest no Okay, hold on. I'm just I'm just gonna check. I'm gonna check Netflix here, to, so I can kind of figure okay, out. Ha- yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll I'll check where I am. Hold on, Netflix. There's like there's like a big there's, there's a chase scene in a forest. For like oh, several episodes. Oh, that sounds. Wait now, hang on now. Uh, is this a, like a part of an episode or is it's, this? It lasts um... for a couple of episodes. Oh no no! I, I, so I'm I have just started uh, episode sixteen. What should be done? Prelude to the counterattack, part three. Okay, okay. Well, there's there's some stuff I can't talk about then. But um, basically, the characters are really incompetent, right? And not only are they really incompetent. They are rewarded for their incompetence. Like, Armin is the, the smart kid, right? The, the kind of weak smart kid. Mm-hmm. The blonde kid. Like, he he's going to be the smart one. And the stuff he comes up with is so ridiculous. Like, he comes to these ridiculous conclusions all the time based on very little information. And he's right all the time. It's just so annoying. It's like, oh, well, if this is the case, then this is the case. Like which it never needs to be, and he's always right. Mm. It's so mm. annoying. I, I I I didn't notice that per se, but I did. It, notice it gets worse. Sort of one dimensionality. <laughs> what? It gets worse. It gets worse. There's more of it oh, to okay. come. And then there's there is a bit where they're they're in a forest, and none of the characters think of using their uh, directional gear, like their their maneuvering gear. Um, in the forest. Mm-hmm. Remember when we saw them training to use their directional gear? Where did we see them training? In a forest. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, it, it, it's see, ridiculous. Is, it doesn't make any sense. Th- this is why when you said the chase in the forest, I had vague memories of a forest type thing, and it must be from that training thing. Yeah. It, it, it's in the next... Um, it's just after where you are, I think. Um, okay. What else? Yeah, and the like the pacing's really bad. There is... In one of the episodes where there's a chase scene... There's a 20 minute flashback in the middle of the episode. The episodes are only like 25 minutes long. So there's this like really tense chase scene. And then suddenly this like only vaguely related uh, flashback, which is there. So like, oh, he remembers something. And then at the end that helps him resolve something small. It's, it's really, really awkward writing. Hmm. Uh, What else have we got here? Oh yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember what it was. I remember what it was. So we've encountered a couple of anomalous titans at this stage, haven't we? We've we've met the, like the colossal titan. Yes. Yeah, and we know Eren is a titan. Yes. Or like transform. Oh, that that was it. Eren transforms into a titan. 
And all of a sudden, everyone assumes that once they know that, all of the other abnormal titans are also people transforming, based on nothing whatsoever. Wait, 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 wait. Is that the case? Because I didn't get that impression whatsoever. I Maybe maybe they, they don't say that yet, but that it happens very, very soon. That, like, oh, there's another abnormal titan, and Eren is an abnormal titan. Therefore, all abnormal titans are transforming people. Like, there's no reason for anyone to to assume that. Oh, that's that's one okay. of the examples of, of the, like the stupid conclusions people come to with no like c- context or analysis whatsoever. They have really bad epistemology. That's all I'm saying. Like, they just like assume things on on ridiculous bases. Um, and the theme song is so good in the first season until they change it halfway through. And the second one isn't anywhere near as good. The first theme song is absolute. It's a jam. It's a total jam in a way that only, for some reason, only seems to happen in Japanese media. This, like, heavy, but also orchestral and choral stuff. (laughs) It's such a jam. I absolutely love it. It's a great, great theme song. But then they go and change it, and it really upsets me. Yeah, yeah, I noted that. I was kind of like, oh, they got rid of the good good theme tune, and they swapped it out for something, um, something worse. Uh, I'm not quite as enthusiastic about the initial team tune as you are. I thought it was fine. I didn't think it was great or anything. Um, but yeah, yeah. But that's just a difference of opinion. Um, do, do you do do you like Attack on Titan or are, like? Because I like it. I just think it has some serious flaws. Uh, there are many good points to it, but a lot of bad points. Where do you fall on the spectrum? I like it grudgingly. <laughs> I begrudgingly like it. Does the uh, does the second season yeah. improve it, uh, or it... I've no idea. I haven't seen the oh, second yes, season. Oh yes, that's right. Sorry, you haven't seen second season. Okay, cool. Um, some good points uh, for me is I I really like the art style. Uh, I like the the sort of like thick black outline they give to characters. It's a really cool aesthetic sort of vibe, um, and I always mm-hmm. enjoy watching how Japanese media portrays European settings because it's 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 like remember we talked about the hyperreal simulacra right it's like watching a hyperreal simulacra and Miyazaki does this as well like in in Castle in the Sky you have like this steampunk Wales that's presented and you're like I, I see how you got there but that's no European would do that and it's really fun and interesting and like, uh, I love like in Japanese media like European settings are always like big thick stone walls like it's always a thing and like these massive huge stone walls and it brings me no amount of joy and I like the sort of I don't know if this was deliberate on them but it's like the sort of uh, Jack and the Beanstalk scary giant sort of European vibe to it like fee fi fo fum mm. here come the titans and like very Germanic yeah it's really Brothers dramatic. Grimm yeah and I really enjoy watching that again because it's like it, it, it offers back to us as Europeans something we we know about uh but in a sort of like wonderfully fantastical way that no european would think of doing i think and i i i love mm-hmm. that i love that um so th- those are well, two an interesting ex- sorry go on after you no 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 i was after you no no i was literally about to say those are the two points and then open the floor to you so you go for it uh, an interesting example of that 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 I like is um well I, I don't like this but it's 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 a fun setting is Bayonetta have you ever played that game no no Bayonetta okay hold on yeah it's it's from about eight years ago maybe okay maybe not that long um and it's it's a Japanese game. And uh, there was a lot of, like, I, I didn't like the it's the gameplay and, and the design and stuff, but the setting in it uh, was, it was kind of like it was meant to be set in, in Europe. And it was sort of based off a, a lot of different things from, from, from the West. Like the, the main character has four guns called Parsley, Sage, Rosemary and Thyme, because that's in Scarborough Fair, I assume. <laughs> uh, and the, the villains were kind of based... It was like this heavenly hierarchy, but it was also influenced by like the aesthetics of the Catholic Church and stuff. So it was the thing that Westerners always do, where we take 
a Japanese idea and completely get it wrong in order to make a film or a video game or something. Mm -hmm. It was like a Japanese company doing that to European Western stuff. And I thought it was really entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I really do think it's, it's so fascinating. Um, Cause yeah, just like you said, it's, 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 we do it so often and it's really interesting to have it done back to us. Really, really fun. Um, yeah. Yeah. Really like it. I, I, some, sometimes I suppose the Germanicness in, in Attack on Titan is it, it snaps you a little bit out of it. Like sometimes it's like way too gener- dramatic. Like, I don't know, you might have a character, I can't remember exact names, but like something like Hans Fritz. And you're like, oh geez, that's very German right there. Like, <laughs> but other than that, it's like- A bit on the nose. It's a bit on the nose. Uh, uh, but other than that, I, I don't really like it. I think it's really good. Um, so I'm going to finish it. And like, overall, it is a sort of positive with Attack on Titan. It's just, yeah, it's just got a couple of like major drawbacks. Um, that make it a little bit hard to watch, but like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go through it. Anyhow, that is my Attack on Titan. Excellent. Cool. Uh, anything else to add or shall we wrap it up for this month? We got through the whole episode. We didn't talk about the World Cup at all. Oh. Because the only important World Cup is the World Cup of Flags. Oh, okay. Really quickly, really quickly. The World Cup of Flags, uh, Panama won. Panama bet South Korea I'll, uh, in, in the final. I will link an infographic... Ridiculous. What? Ridiculous. <laughs> well, hang on one second now. I, I'm going to link uh, an infographic in the show notes that I made that tracks how the competition played out and you can see all the heads, uh, head-to-head battles and how they played. Uh, I get the impression, Bill, that uh, you, you are not happy with the result? South Korea is clearly way better than Panama. I... Do you know what? I have changed my mind on this. Uh, South Korea is a great, great, great flag, but I think Panama is uh, is stronger because it uses more basic shapes, fewer shapes. Now, again, this is very personal to me. It's very, very minimalistic, but it conveys an awful lot in that. Whereas South Korea is very cool, but we have like complex swirls going on, the complex um, logo graphs or whatever they were called uh, at the side. So it's it's a little bit more Panama's more plain and it's very close to Texas and Texas is a great 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 flag so I think I've changed my opinion I wanted South Korea to win but I'm glad Panama did I think that's cool I'm, I'm happy with that fix <laughs> what I what I'm not happy about is how far Morocco got into the competition if I recall correctly I think the Moroccan flag is just crap like I'm sorry Moroccan people but like th- th- like the red and green just hurt my eyes looking at it. And the, the star is so small in the middle. And it's just, it's, I think it's an utter, utter train wreck. Um, I, I really, really like vehemently dislike the Moroccan flag. And you could fix it so much, like so easily with just putting a white circle around the star. Done. Cool. You have a bit of contrast that's brought in and it's very identifiable, but it's not, I, just, I don't like Morocco, but everyone loved it. They just kept voting for it. And I was like, what is this? This is terrible. But yes, uh, any, anything else to add or should we, should we wrap up? I think we should wrap up. Cool. Uh, Bill, as always, pleasure talking to you. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. And pleasure talking to you, Edgar. Yeah, cool. And uh, thank you to all the Patreon supporters who help make this show a possibility. And we will see you all next month. And until then, Edgar, Edgar out. out.